enough. And I've been kind of just grooving on the whole morning so far. And I guess I could also <laughs> share what Gustavo shared earlier, that Peter was also, unlike Peter, he was actually my, my mentor. And after getting phone calls, know that. it was insane. After getting phone calls at 2 in the morning saying, your logic. There's no logic here. Let the data speak. Let the data go. <laughs> but I very much appreciate that. So I also have a couple of, of, of stories that I'm going to share with you. Um, I'm going to sort of begin by kind of autobiographically contextualizing myself. And one of the things that, um, one of the distinctions when I was thinking about this whole um, question uh, for the session is how can academic work support local and global resistance. Uh, you know, one of the, the first things that came to mind was I oftentimes, and, and part of this has to do with something we've actually been talking about sort of non-formally on the side this morning in the midst of all of this, is really what a dehumanizing, um, horrible, anti-pedagogical environment we mostly occupy. Uh, you know, institutions of higher education and schools, and it's gotten worse and worse as these shifts have happened in terms of what is the bottom line, what are the outcomes that are expected of us. It's, it's a harsh dehumanizing space. And, and so part, I think, of what we really need to do together, and I think our, us coming together in, in environments like this is, is a big part of this, is how can we support uh, each other and build also sort of counter identities that are linked to institutional realities that we live in, but also very cognizant that they are very problematic spaces. And, and uh, so when I'm thinking about that, um, I have things that I consider to be my work, <laughs> and I have things that I consider part of my job. And in terms of my job, that's what pays me. That's what allows me to eat, <laughs> and that's what allows me to raise my children. Um, and I, my job is in Wisconsin. I work in Wisconsin. I work in Eau Claire. I work in teacher education. Um, it's, you know, from the way we've all been trained and coming out of UCLA, you know, we were really trained, and I think a lot of it was part of this whole institutional indoctrination, but that the only worthwhile work is publishing, that the only worthwhile work is how many books have you published, with whom, that the only worthwhile work, so part of sort of trying to figure out what my identity as a scholar is, or what my identity as an activist is, or what my identity as a human being is, as a female who has raised children, one of my former students, had a couple of years ago uh, coined the term mother scholar, which I really like, because how often do we embrace that identity? We don't. We have a mother scholar who is here with us, and now you know she's taken the young scholar somewhere else. So these spaces are even inhumane for our different lived realities. Um, but this whole idea of uh, having to constantly renegotiate within ourselves, um, if you end up in sort of an unsexy job like mine, where I'm working at a at a, a teacher ed institution where we have a 4-4 load and we're working and we're teaching. But that's a really important space. As one of my colleagues said, you know, somebody's got to do that work. Not because not everybody will do it, but because we are there. We are in the communities. We are with the teachers. We are, uh, in, in my case, in western Wisconsin, I would say it's probably one of the most um, problematic spaces. It, it's very representative of this sort of harsh gringo landia. <laughs> um, you know, we have 100% of our African American male students in our school district who have been, uh, when, when referred to uh, special education services, 100% of them are designated emotionally and behaviorally disordered. Oh my God. So, and, and what I say is, our school of teacher education, we created that Frankenstein monster. We can change that, and that's our responsibility. So we have a, a local, in the job that I do, I have a local responsibility to work, to, to shift that uh, cultural context, which, you know, sends our kids to fight happily in Iraq and Afghanistan, which creates this idea of teachers as compliant with the corporate models that are coming through, you know, which creates these sort of unproblematic or unproblematized um, environments where people are just seen as a technocrat that is going to be able to write their scripted 
lesson plan and put it in place and they're so happy just because they love kids and it's like do you not see the violence that you're doing so I think on that level in terms of the job that we're doing uh, we have that immediate and we have that space uh, wherever it is that we happen to be working right so I think part of this is understanding what is your sphere of influence and I think coming to that also with a with a, a level of humility because you know I was not trained that this is legitimate work I was not told that coming through the academy. And I think we need to reclaim that space, that it is legitimate work, and that's powerful work, and that it's important work. Um, so that's, that's sort of the, 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 the piece about the job. The other piece about the job is that, as we know, there's the sort of personal transformation and critical transformation and reflexive and reflective approach that we all need to take as we develop these kind of um, Counter hegemonic identities, you know, that are taking active um, action to, to shift the conditions that we're working in and living in. Um, but there's also this institutional piece. And we have to also work to transform the institution. And so, at, you know, when you're in a smaller site or even a larger site, I think we can look at how do we impact the communities that we're responsible for, or not responsible for, responsive to, <laughs> and how do we also uh, work to dismantle the really problematic um, sort of power relationships and institutional structures that have continued to perpetuate this very negative space that most of us occupy. And so I think that's another really important part of the work that we're all doing, wherever we happen to be. Um, so that's sort of thinking about the job that I do. <laughs> when I think about the work that I do, um, and of course I do some work at my job, but <laughs> when I think about the work that I do, I, I do most of my work in, in Chile. And I've been working in Chile um, since probably 1997 or something like that, um, when I was able to go there and, and work on some projects, uh, reforming teacher education in the southern area, and I continued um, that relationship up until, I mean, to the present moment, and so now I go there most most years. And um, when I'm working in Chile, what, and, and we'll be talking about this actually tomorrow, so I want to invite everybody to come to our session tomorrow afternoon, but uh, Chile is, is, it was the very first country in the world to adopt 100%, basically, the neoliberal education model. Um, the coup happened in September 11, 1973, um, Milton Friedman visited Chile in March. So, and, and said, you know, oh, this is the perfect place to do all this stuff. Of course, unions were banned immediately, um, so they didn't have any kind of resistance happening. Well, and you would die if you wanted to resist anything. Um, so they reformed the entire educational system almost, well, it took a couple of years really, but it was basically overnight, and with no resistance, because there was no possibility for that. Um, and so in the work of, in Chile, while understanding sort of how the, the context, the political and the um, economic context in this country is impacting where we are and what's happening in education. In Chile, I was very much kind of stepping in to this historical moment where it was re-democratized and there were all these very kind of interesting progressive things going on uh, in terms of education policy and reinvestment in the public sector, but the whole structural piece that governed these neoliberal reforms was never changed at all. And in fact, a lot of the progressive reforms um, were aimed at sort of increasing the technical capacity of everybody who worked in the system to better go along with the system. So on the one hand, there was this kind of superficial reinvestment in the public sphere, in the public sector, but on the other hand, the structure remained exactly the same. And what we've seen from, from the late 90s up to today has been every set of reforms that have come since, whether it's been, and mostly been with sort of liberal Democrat, nominally socialist governments, um, you've seen a, a re-entrenchment of the model and actually a support of this, of, of this neoliberal model. Um, and so now at this point, and this is almost 40 years of experience with this model, um, when I was there last year, um, the students were on strike. And they'd already been on strike in 2006, they had the Revolución Pinguino, which were all the high school kids that went out on the street and said, we want a good education. 
they said we want to get rid of um, the LOSE, which was the the constitutional education law that, that dictated how education would be run, uh, that Pinochet put in place. And they succeeded. They got rid of the LOSE. So they, they, it, which was amazing because you had all these little kids out on the streets and they shut the country down for months and months and months. They said, we need to get rid of the LOSE. They've been advocating for that for 20 years. So they put in the new law, the Ley General de Educación, which was exactly the same as the LOSE. <laughs> but with some other spaces opened up, different name, same structure, but now some new spaces were opened up that actually the students had demanded themselves. Things like teacher evaluation. We want you to evaluate our teachers. We want accountability for our teachers. Um, uh, and some other kind of things. Well, what happened then, of course, is the model, the structure that we still remained the same, now has new opportunities to exploit the model <laughs> and further create these oppressive kind of educational practices. So now, teachers are all evaluated. Only public school teachers, nobody else. Because that would be infringing on the free market, and they're free to do whatever they want. So, uh, you know, the students have, have had this uprising in 2006. Uh, in 2007, 2008, the teachers were on the street because they were saying, oh, this look, this Le General de Educación is more of the same. Um, and then again, last year when I was there, um, again, the students were on the streets, but this time, it was university students who had been the penguinos before. They're smarter, they're wiser, they're more savvy, and they shut down the, the country. And actually, they shut down most of the public schools throughout the country, many, many, many of the universities throughout the country, um, and most of them lost a year of their education, uh, formal education. They gained a year of non-formal education. Now, the interesting thing is that, again, uh, this year, they're organizing to continue the protest and to continue the strike. So we have contrasted here, you know, me, myself, with my gringa identity <laughs> going into Chile uh, as a researcher, also as a colleague, because I work with people in, the, in uh, La Católica and Valparaíso and in other kind of sites, uh, also working with students as, a, as an instructor in the universities. But when I ask myself, how does my work, what, what is the role of my work in this site? I have to kind of rethink my own positionality, not in terms of my critical identity, but in terms of how am I effective in that setting? And is that even an arrogant thing to think about? Because I'm there more than anything else to be learning from them and to see how can we share our understandings and our critique and our experience to really try to create some kind of space to support the kind of radical transformative action that the students there are engaged in. And I think that's a really interesting piece because when you step into that site, um, you know, often, depending on where I am and who I'm working with, uh, sort of the, the Chileans who have a real hard, um, heavy critique, uh, it will take a while for them even to talk to me because for them, I embody you know, this gringo kind of oppressor. And so it takes a while to build that relationship so then we can actually work together um, so that they understand sort of where I'm coming from and how Chile is a part of my own history. But the idea is behind part of this that whatever our site of work or whatever the job that we do, um, I think that it's good for us to step back Think about what we are lacking ourselves, how many assumptions we're making, how we can contribute. Like you said, what do you need from us? You know, what do you need from me? So, for example, right now in Chile, I work with the ministry and I evaluate students who've applied to do graduate work here in the United States, or anywhere in the, in the United States, in Canada, and we have some in Australia. Um, and I can support them in that. I can also support them when we're there by creating opportunities to have these kind of critical discussions because in a lot of those, the contexts in Chile, it's a very conservative space. It's a very um, traumatized space in terms of the fear that still exists, um, especially on, among my colleagues um, who need to really be careful who they talk to and what they talk about and how they define themselves if they want to keep their jobs. 
and trying to figure out uh, for the students that are just coming up and coming through, is there really a legitimate way that I can be supportive to them? And recognizing in some cases, maybe there isn't. Because I don't have that kind of influence. And do, is it fair for me to ask them to engage in these kind of critiques and debates when their livelihood could be at stake? So it's always sort of being very conscious of you know, what assumptions we might have what eagerness we might have to go forward, um, because we all know we have a lot of work to do, and the struggle is multi-headed, <laughs> and you know, and the resistance to to the, the sort of oppressive conditions that we're in is happening on multiple levels. But understanding kind of our own commitments and our own ongoing solidarity, and I think it is about building those relationships, whether it's with the schools and the communities that you live in, that you work in or whether it's, it's with individuals that are participants in different projects that you're working in, and always looking to say, you know, what can we do for you? What do you need from us? And, um, and always kind of entering that with a, with a good, hearty dose of humility and understanding our own limitations. But that doesn't mean you hold back or you negate the possibility that something else can come out of it. So that's what came to mind when I was thinking about that. And I think we really just, we go forward, we try to create these hegemonic, anti-hegemonic spaces, and we continue the struggle in every, by all means necessary, and by every, in every space that we find available to us to step into and try to be of service to humanity, really. I mean, that sounds kind of, bizarre, and it's not quite the right language I want to use, but, but I think you all know what I'm talking about. We're trying to make, build a better world, and we might not always know what that is. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting, we know what it isn't, 